obviously you are more familiar with where scholarship is on all these related issues than probably anyone in the world. Anyone in the whole wide world? There's only one person who knows more about resurrection than Gary, and that's Jesus. Mm, Jesus. That's fair. And since Jesus isn't currently taking my resurrection questions, maybe Gary will. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. If you're new to the channel, you should know that for several years now, I've been quite obsessed with evaluating the evidence for Jesus' resurrection, and in particular, the popular minimal facts approach pioneered by Dr. Gary Habermas. He is not a fan of mine. Paul Lugia explains this. He's going he's gonna to get it wrong. Now, for the past 14 years... Gary has been working on his self-declared magnum opus, a four-volume, 4,000 or so page, Tome on the Resurrection. Volume 1, which lays out the positive case for resurrection, came out earlier in the year, and I released a few videos about that. Volume 2, which purports to refute naturalistic resurrection hypotheses, came out a month ago. I've just finished reading that one, and I'm working on an extended video on that to come out soonish. As far as I can tell... Gary has done only one interview for the second volume, which I've covered here. But while vacationing with his friend and fellow apologist, Mike Lacona, the pair of them decided to do an impromptu Q&A live stream. Well, hello everyone. I'm Mike Lacona, and this is my best friend, other than my wife, Debbie Lacona. I don't know who this is, but it's not Debbie. Um, uh, this is Gary Habermas here. I'm not Debbie. Let's yeah, let's see. Click here when live for... Sh Dream. Okay. Sorry, this is like the first time I've done this on my own live. Anyway, here's what happens. Gary and Eileen Habermas, every fall for many years, over two decades, it was for Labor Day, they would come and spend a week with us, with Debbie and me. Um, anyway, we wanted to bless you guys. We wanted to open it up for some live Q&A and let's see, I hope I can figure out how to do this. Obviously, I couldn't resist throwing in a few questions for such an occasion. And they actually answered one. But first I learned that Gary and I are essentially living the same life. Okay. And so I started studying the resurrection every night when I came in from hockey. Hockey and resurrection. Well, that's pretty cool. Good combination. Are you kidding me? I started studying the resurrection every night when I'm not watching hockey. Gary, when you're done your book, and I'm done mine, we need to start a podcast. You've already suggested the perfect name, the Hockey and Resurrection Podcast, where a Christian and an atheist, who don't get along, talk about the NHL and the evidence for Jesus' resurrection. I'm a lifelong Oilers fan. Growing up in Detroit, I assume you're a Red Wings fan, Gary. Turns out I'm from the same hometown as Gordy Howe which we can talk about on the podcast, from NDEs to PPGs. It'll be great. Now, last time we heard from Mike Lacona, he was giving my minimal witnesses hypothesis a failing grade. Give us a, give us a percentage. What, what, chance, what, what is the percentage chance you think that holds water? Zero. And I, I'm, Zero not just, yeah, I, I'm not just trying to, to say that. I mean, there's a lot of wrong with what he just said. But before this video is through, Mike Lacona is going to earn back some of my respect. And totally redeem yourself. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, Paula Gia here. How can Opus volume number two use group appearances as its primary defense against hallucinations and illumination when group appearances are not a minimal fact nor affirmed by skeptical scholars? Okay. As a bit of background here, Gary's books define hallucination hypotheses and illumination hypotheses as two categories of naturalistic attempts to explain the disciples' belief that they saw the risen Jesus. For Gary, a hallucination hypothesis proposes that the disciples' appearances were false perceptions of sight, seeing something that isn't really there, where an illumination hypothesis suggests that Peter, and subsequently other disciples, had subjective experiences or insight that led them to believe in Jesus' resurrection. Gary's refutations of both hallucination and illumination in volume two of the book lean heavily on his opinion that these notions cannot explain how groups of people saw risen Jesus. Unfortunately, he spends no time considering whether or not groups of people actually saw Jesus, or if perhaps we just have stories about groups of people. 
So I wanted to know how a project based on a specific set of minimal facts could justify basing its refutations on elements that are not part of said minimal facts. So Doc, our group appearance is part of your minimal facts. We'll, we'll get into this in a moment. Hold sure. your questions for right sure. now. We'll let Gary answer this, Paul Aguia. But Then everybody else, hold your questions for right now. We'll get to it. Um, so are the group appearances part of the minimal facts? And do skeptical, non-believing New Testament scholars grant them? They are definitely part of the minimal facts. They are not. To review, here's Gary's list of facts, taken directly from page 149 in volume 1. 1. Jesus died due to the effects of Roman crucifixion. 2. The disciples afterwards reported experiences that they thought were actually appearances of the risen Jesus. 3. These experiences accounted for the disciples' lives becoming thoroughly transformed, even to the point of being willing to die for their belief. 4. The proclamation of Jesus' resurrection and appearances took place very early, soon after the experiences themselves. 5. James, the brother of Jesus and a skeptic before his conversion most likely believed after he also thought that he saw the risen Jesus. Six, just a few years later, Saul of Tarsus Paul also became a Christian believer due to an experience that he also concluded was an appearance of the risen Jesus to him. There's nothing in here about group appearances. Number two is worded very carefully. Disciples reported experiences they thought were actually appearances. The statement carefully avoids how many of the disciples said this. I say it's just one, maybe two if I'm feeling generous. And it avoids putting any kind of qualifier on the nature of these experiences. If you start adding qualifiers like bodily or group or visual, Gary would no longer be expressing something that the majority of scholars consider to be a fact. Group appearances are not a minimal fact, Gary, and you know it. But you're gonna do a dance here to pretend you're good. Because the minimal facts start with data, with the early creeds all the way up through at least the epistles of Paul. We use the uh, gospel. Uh, I'll, I'll say, so what's the criteria for it to be a minimal fact? Okay, a minimal fact by definition <clears throat> is a, an historical fact for which there are enough detailed pieces of data to describe something according to the canons of historicity. Now, we'd have to talk about that, what makes an historical <clears throat> fact, but the first criteria is not skeptics agree or historians agree. Never has been. Sure, but it is the second criteria, again, from volume one of his book. What are the prerequisites for an occurrence to be designated as a minimal fact. From the outset of my studies on the death and resurrection of Jesus, my thesis has been that there are at least two major requirements for an occurrence to be designated in this manner. Each of these events must be established by an abundance of strong evidences, usually by multiple critically ascertained independent lines of historical argumentation. In addition, the vast majority of published contemporary scholars with credentials in relevant fields of study have to acknowledge the historicity of the event. If both criteria must be present, then it doesn't much matter which criteria is first and which is second. I get that you think the first is more important, but don't pretend like scholarly consensus isn't part of it. And your friend Mike does you one better, insisting that it must be a plurality of scholars, not just evangelical Christians. Um, so you could say it's a heterogeneous majority, but... By far, the majority of scholars who grant the empty tomb are Christian scholars. Um, and it doesn't come up to the level, even though it's a majority, if it's around 75%, that's a pretty strong majority. But I like it to be 90% or more for what I'm doing here, a nine, you know, for, for my criteria for accepting something as historical bedrock. So it didn't quite make a strong enough majority, and it certainly not a robust heterogeneity of scholarship um, that is granting it. By far, the first criterion is enough data to call something a fact. And since when the data are very good, critics jump on board and don't argue. Exactly. If critics aren't jumping on board, then it's a sign there isn't enough data to call something a fact. Here's where the difference lies. Nobody's saying, nobody's saying 
that the critics are going to bit the facts, and therefore they're going to fall on their knees and trust Christ. No, no, Gary, that's not the question. You can't prematurely punt to, we agree on the facts, we just differ on interpretation, that we hear so much from young earth creationists. Because we all have the same evidence, we have the same rock layers, we have the same fossils, but again, it comes down to the interpretation based on whatever starting point, whatever assumption that we have. You can either start with God's word or not God's word. You've skipped a step on my question. Before we can talk about interpreting group appearances differently, I'm going to need you to establish that there is heterogeneous agreement that this is, indeed, a fact that can be interpreted. There are always differences in interpretation of the data. That's where the difference lies. But you have the data for the facts, and then you have the f that when enough facts coalesce to call something historical, Virtually everybody jumps in at that point for the, for the six events that I call minimal facts. And none of your minimal facts are group appearances. That's why I asked my question. Group appearances aren't a fact to be interpreted. And by the way, contrary to much popular opinion, the, min the empty tomb has never been one of my six minimal facts. I'm going to get a lot of use out of that clip. Christians keep thinking the empty tomb is a fact to be explained. Did you hear that in the back, Christians? Empty tomb has never been one of the six minimal facts to be explained. It's got to be well evidenced, and, and it's got to be granted by a vast majority of scholars. That's the second, and and I'm not just saying. And this, what, do you, what what qualifies as a vast majority? Uh, good question. We've never put a lot of people say things. We get emails saying, "Oh, you guys say it's got to be over ninety percent." I don't think I've ever said that. I don't know if you've ever said that. But I like it to be ninety percent or more for what I'm doing here. Well, Gary, I don't know if you said it, but you certainly wrote it from volume one of your book. An oft asked question relates to my repeated references that the vast majority of scholars, or virtually all of these experts agree with this or that conclusion. Can these phrases be identified in more precise terms? In some contexts, I have already been more specific, at least when referencing the shorter list of minimal historical facts. I most frequently think in terms of a 90-something percentile headcount. The, the rules were that the you economy, guys weren't going to fact check. We don't put amounts on it, but I would say something that, I, that qualifies as vast majority of critical scholars. And the first criterion is enough evidence to call it a fact. A second one to say most scholars agree with these. Exactly. Why were you protesting against the scholar criteria so vigorously at the start of this discussion? Most, get, most scholars is 50.1%. I'd say it's much, much, much higher than that. I mean, one time you told me vast majority would be like around 85%. I would say... Are well, you backing down from I that? Think, no, no, no. I think over 80 is fair, over 85 is fair, over 90 is fair. It's good that it's fair because your book says... So I most frequently think in terms of a 90-something percentile headcount. And you're going to get different percentages depending on different facts you're talking about. Yes, that's how claims work. A different percentage of people will agree with each one. Many accept this fact that Graceland is the former home of Elvis Presley, located in Memphis, Tennessee. Not as many people accept this fact that Elvis is still alive and well, though some believe it. A less specific claim is going to have broader support than a more specific claim. For example, more people will agree that pizza is delicious than will agree that pizza with olives is delicious. Of course, more scholars can get on board with the vague statement that the disciples had some kind of experience than the number of scholars who would affirm that the disciples specifically had group experiences. That's why I needed to ask the specific question in the first place. If your defense against hallucination is group appearances, then you'll need to demonstrate the group appearances are a heterogeneously accepted fact that needs explanation. If you're talking about Jesus' crucifixion, that's going to be very, very high. Sure, but if you're saying vast majority and you're using this as a criterion, did you, did you have any percentage in mind? Never had a percentage. That's odd, because the book you wrote that came out just a few months ago says... So I most frequently think in terms of a 90-something percentile headcount. Did I never count, did a headcount? Uh, I did a headcount uh, on the empty tomb. It's not one of the... It's not one of the six facts. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait just a minute there, Dr. Habermas. The second criteria is... The vast majority of published contemporary scholars with credentials in relevant fields of study have to acknowledge the historicity 
of the event. And you didn't do a head count to determine what portion of the scholars agree? You spent 14 years on these books to tell us what most scholars think, and now you're telling me you haven't done a systematic count to see if most scholars agree? I've been waiting with bated breath for what I understood apparently mistakenly, what volume three was going to be. I thought we were finally getting an enumeration of the bean counting that Gary has been peddling for years, promising the receipts later. Here's how Gary described volume three just earlier this year. Volume three is, I'm moving away from apologetics now with volume three. Okay. Volume three started out as 1,500 pages, wow. and we've honed it down to about 800. And it is a who's who of liberal, all the way to very liberal atheist New Testament scholars, all the way to very conservative New Testament writers with credentials. Very conservative, but you know, PhD. And uh, what we did was try to survey about 140. My research assistant said it's more like 200. He said he's the one that typed it up. Uh, about 140 questions minimum from Good Friday to the Ascension. Am I crazy? But was Gary not promising us some kind of survey? So you got about 40 days here. Mm. And think of all the questions you could ask. Why the third day? Um, how did Jesus appear? What's our earliest evidence? Every question you can think of. And all we do in volume three is not argue for anything. We give a landscape view from really liberal to really conservative so everybody can see. I hope the guys who read it said that volume three will be a basis for people doing MA theses and PhD dissertations because it, it, it links the field. Okay. I've written two little books on the resurrection of theology and resurrection of practice, but nobody knows about it. They didn't sell a lot. So I've been, I'm criticized sometimes. All this guy does is talk about evidence, evidence, evidence. Does he do anything else on the resurrection? Well, volume three is the overview. So book three is a giant survey, even though you've never done a survey on anything other than the empty tomb, which is not a minimal fact because it failed said survey. So what would you I say about... Not, I do not have a preset percentage. Oh no, we missed by 5%. No, so I've in, never in ever answer to that. Paul Aguia, yeah. you would say that there's, there's strong data for the group appearances. Um, exactly, and I'll tell you why the vast majority of the appearances recorded. Most scholars would agree that people in history have claimed to have seen dragons. It is also true that the majority of accounts depict dragons as capable of flight, but there is no transitive property that somehow forces scholars to therefore agree that dragons can fly. If you think the appearances are... Included, so when you say vast majority of appearances recorded, what do you mean by that? When the appearances are recorded in, <clears throat> in the 1 Corinthians 15 Creed, the Acts Sermon Summaries, and Paul's Epistles, other places, the, the majority of appearances are two groups. This is so disingenuous. Gary has whole chapters in these first two volumes talking about why skeptical scholars will grant his general appearances fact. And it has little to do with the 1 Corinthians Creed or the Acts Sermon Summaries. Instead, Volume 2 in particular talks about how most historians up to the 19th century just took such things on board because they were a pervasive belief. The skepticism comes in later scholarship. Since then, it's more the perception of disciple transformation and the logistical need for an early catalyst of Christianity that causes skeptical scholars to grant a general appearance belief, but not affirmation of appearances themselves. You know this, and that's why you phrased your fact to accommodate this. Yes, some skeptics are willing to grant that the creeds and sermons you reference are early, but that's not the same as granting that their content is accurate. Those same creeds and sermons say that Jesus rose from the dead. So if granting that they are early is the same as granting that they are universally true in every detail, then all of those scholars would just be universally accepting resurrection as true. But they're not. Given that people can grant part of a claim without granting all of the claim, that makes my question the relevant question, and your bluster is just bluster to obfuscate the problem. But ma more majority is 50.1%. There's more than 50.1% on, I mean, two disciples on the way to Emmaus, two's a group, but you only have... I have to be honest with you, I, I wish you would have defined vast majority and, and quantified a little bit better than what you've done. Uh, 
That's good, but I've never done it. So I most frequently think in terms of a 90-something percentile headcount. I'm really appreciating that Mike is pressing Gary on this. Much harder than McDowell or Turek, the select few apologists he's willing to talk to anymore. I just don't want to be blamed for something I didn't do. And the and the empty tomb yeah, but you, was never you've part done of all the these sex. counts over the years. Just one, and the empty tomb is the only one I can actually count doing it. I can only remember doing a head count. All right, Gary is doubling down. There can be no mistake. He's never done a head count. And yet, here's what his publisher has to say about volume three. In the third volume of his magnum opus, Gary R. Habermas identifies, collects, and summarizes hundreds of scholarly treatments related to the resurrection. On the Resurrection, Volume 3, Scholarly Perspectives, offers a thorough lay of the land for anyone wanting to pursue an in-depth study of Jesus of Nazareth's resurrection. But that's not a head count. I'm so disappointed. What's more important today is Gary has only his own intuition, selection bias, and confirmation bias to tell us what the majority of scholars think about group appearances or any appearances at all for that matter, because he insists he's done no head count. And the reason I say I don't do a count is because empty tomb is not one of the minimal facts. Okay. Never has been. I, you can, I find one of my publications where I find, and I'm, you're not saying this, but several do, and you count the uh, empty tomb as one of the minimal <clears throat> facts. Show me where I did that. All right, so when you say, all right, you're saying a majority, would, would you say a strong majority? Yes. Would you say I have a plethora of piñatas? A what? A plethora. Oh, yes. <laughs> you have a plethora. Of, of scholars grant the group appearances? They grant appearances, and since the majority of the appearance... Nope. And by the way, I'm not cutting off Gary's sentence there. That's when he cut himself off and started a new one. Squirrel! You can't conflate granting claims of appearances with granting actual appearances. Gary's second volume lays out the positions of David Strauss... Rudolf Boltmann, Gerd Ludemann, John Dominic Crossan, Bart Ehrman, Hans Grass, Reginald Fuller, A.M. Ramsey, and others, so he should know where the consensus lies. In his book, Gary knows that group appearances are not widely accepted. The closest he comes is where he says scholars affirm that there are multiple sources who claim group appearances. Even most skeptical scholars have acknowledged the multiple attestation of sources regarding several of the accounts where the witnesses are recorded as having seen the risen Jesus together. For the record, I don't acknowledge this multiple attestation, and I suspect that if I dug deep, these scholars wouldn't either. But I can grant it for the point of this video to note that this claim is miles from the question of scholars granting actual group appearances. Again, do scholars agree that multiple sources claimed dragons could fly? Yes. Does that mean these scholars also agree that dragons could fly or even existed? No. If you're only going to count appearances to single individuals to get away from groups, I don't think that's fair. And the earliest account... Well, it, I it, think it's fair. Thank you, Mike. I also think it's fair. When we talk about answering hallucinations, one of the, the, the Correct. responses we give, group appearances. Right. So isn't it fair? It's fair for someone like right. Paul Aguirre or someone to say, well, what percentage of scholars today in the field would grant the group appearances? Thank you. That is my question. Will Gary give an answer? If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Yeah, and in the earliest creed in 1 Corinthians 15, mm -hmm. three of the five are the groups. So you can't go in there and say, well, I'm going to take Peter, and I'm going to take James, but I'm, I won't take the three group appearances there. I mean, we've got to be fair with the data. Yeah. There's three groups and two individuals in that particular list. The hypothetical scholar you're talking about would already be rejecting the resurrection part of the creed. So must, by definition, be picking and choosing which parts seem plausible and which implausible. Just because you want to treat this passage as a homogenous truth blob doesn't mean everyone has to be as unnuanced. If you're never going to answer my actual question, maybe you would instead answer the question of what percentage of scholars grant that every single word of the 1 Corinthians 15 creed is historically reliable. I'm guessing your avoidance stance would be roughly the same. And again, let's not fall for Gary's implication that this creed is the reason some skeptics grant general appearances. No, it's external corroboration that sways here, not internal witness. So when... In answer to Paul Aguirre, then, um, skeptics, he's saying, skeptical scholars do not grant the group appearance. And of course, when we're saying this, we're saying, 
we're not saying they actually saw the risen Jesus. We're saying that these scholars would say that groups of people simultaneously experienced, had an experience they interpreted as the risen Jesus appearing to them. And that these appearances were so similar, they thought they saw the same thing. Would that be a fair? That, that's fair. Yeah. Now, when, just so we're not prejudicing anything, when you say groups, we're not talking there's got to be 20 or we don't count. No, it's... Two's a group, five's a group. Okay. The three groups in the in the uh, creed, earliest creed. To the 12, 12 to more than 500 to all the all apostles. All the apostles. Okay. And 500 at one time. So what about skeptical scholars? What skeptical... Would you say those? All right. So, I mean, obviously, you are more familiar with where scholarship is on all these related issues than probably anyone in the world. Are there a lot of skeptical scholars who would grant the group appearances? Mike kindly steelmans this into a point blank yes or no question. Will Gary give a point blank yes or no answer? One answer yes or no, right now. I think what they're going to say is this. There are groups of people who thought they saw the risen Jesus. What Gary imagines people would say isn't evidence about what they say. My intuition is the exact opposite of Gary's on this matter. And apparently Gary has never actually counted to check, so we're at a stalemate. The problem is not how many people were there. The problem absolutely is how many people were there. Your refutation of hallucination rests entirely on how many people were there. If you're going to grant that it doesn't matter or that you cannot establish how many people were there, then you've completely given up your defense against hallucination theories. The problem, well, so-and-so thinks there were people there but doesn't agree with your conclusion. The problem is the interpretation of the data. Right, so but that's I what I'm saying. Would you how, what, Name some skeptical scholars who would say they would grant that there were groups of people who had experiences they interpreted as a risen Jesus appearing to them. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate Mike for holding Gary to the fire for me. Sure. Um, Ed Sanders is in a group who says, Ed Sanders, lives, he called himself a liberal, taught at Oxford and Duke, and he said that appearances, what he, here's how he says it. The apostles, several of them at one time, he doesn't give, um, nobody gives numbers. I mean, unless you lose, cite the creed of 1 Corinthians 15 in a few of the Acts sermon <clears throat> summaries. They'll say, there's people there, and they were convicted they saw the risen Jesus. And some of them will say things like this. Um, were they individually convinced? Were they to con convinced together? But there were groups who thought they saw something. Aha. Well, if they were individually convinced then Gary's group appearances defense against hallucinations doesn't stand. And hallucinations do stand as a reasonable explanation. All right, give, me some, give us some names of some non-believing scholars who say that. I would say, well, Ed Sanders does <clears throat> say, not only does he say there were, there were these groups, he said he believes, and I won't even go this far, but he thinks it is one of the indescribable, one of the clearest facts, mark my words, he says that they saw the risen Jesus. He says that at least twice. And then he says, now, I'm not equipped to say how they saw him or what they saw, but they thought they saw the risen Jesus. Groups. Together. Yes. More okay. than one. Mark Ed Sanders, together. and he's a non-believer. He just called himself a liberal. I don't know where I, he is. I will give Gary credit. I think he's accurately describing E.P. Sanders' position. Sanders supposed that multiple disciples had experiences in the manner described in the Gospels, but he doesn't specifically ascribe what these experiences were. Sanders describes himself as a liberal Protestant, as Gary said, and he allowed himself to be introduced as a believer on at least one occasion. This one's a close call, which is fine, but is a close call really the first and best example Gary can give us? What about non-believers? Well, I don't, I, I can't describe, I, I can't vouch for what's in someone's heart or what's, I, I hate to say someone's a believer, someone's not. I don't want to start being judgmental and say someone's a believer. How can you purport to be telling us what skeptical scholars think if you're not even willing to attempt to classify people according to what they believe? You're conflating some nebulous notion of spiritual salvation requiring knowing someone's heart with the more binary, measurable academic position of accepting or not accepting a physical resurrection of Jesus. This should be an easy question for the greatest resurrection scholar on earth. Accept the Lord Jesus 
So well, if not. someone like Bart Ehrman comes out and says he doesn't believe Jesus rose from the dead, he's a non-believer. Correct. Correct. Okay. Ed Sanders, I would put Dale Allison in this group. Tom Wright is in this group. But, but Dale Allison, I'd, I'd say he is a believer. At very least, Dale Allison affirms a bodily resurrection of Jesus. Thank you, Mike. But he, Okay, but he says that the, a, a very, you know, he's, he's given credit with him. I know some skeptics who love Dale Allison because I have to consider no, him. I love Dale Allison. I've had him on my channel twice. He's still not a skeptical scholar. And he starts his he's last a great book scholar. by saying, he starts his last book by saying, on page three, right at the beginning, he says, I believe, I'm going to give you my view up front. I think the disciples saw Jesus. Fact check on page three, and Gary's correct, down to the page number. Good job, Gary. Dr. Allison writes, I believe that the disciples saw Jesus. But his next words are, and that he saw them. So in the same sentence, Dale affirms he believes in risen Jesus, who saw disciples, making Dale a believer. I know, but they he is not a non-believer. But he's going to... He's going to come back against those who say they saw I Jesus. I know, but we're asking for non-believers here. Paul Legia is asking for non-believing scholars. Take a slipede. Did he say the group appearances? Yes, he did. Right. He actually believed Jesus rose, he's, too. That's correct. Pincus Lapide absolutely believed and affirmed that Jesus rose from the dead. He's only noteworthy because he preferred to call himself Jewish. But a skeptical scholar would be one who doesn't affirm Jesus' resurrection. So Pincus doesn't count. Century so we got Pincus Lapid. What other uh, non-believing scholar? Yeah, you, you did more on Gazer Ramesh than I did, but Gazer Ramesh says there are groups who claim this. Now he's going to beg off on what they mean. He's an agnostic. Even I acknowledge that there were groups who claimed group appearances. That's not the question here. Giza Vermes rejected group appearances due to a lack of independent witnesses, inconsistencies and contradictions in the Gospels, questionable reliability of witnesses, and his suspicion that any who did see something were hallucinating. This is an opposite example of what we're looking for, Gary. No. He's going to ask what happened. Garrett Ludeman says the disciples thought they saw Jesus immediately. Now, he thinks they're hallucinations, but that's my right. point. That's you okay, can disagree though. On the he still agrees on the group appearance. Again, Gary couldn't be more wrong here. Ludeman suggests that accounts of group appearances are likely rooted in an initial vision experienced by Peter, which was then amplified and spread through social and psychological mechanisms, which is exactly what I think. Ludeman thinks that all of the group appearance stories are legendary development. He says that the 1 Corinthians 15 creed Gary has been talking about emerged within 20 years of Jesus' death. So I guess Gary's definition of immediately is a little less than mine. This is embarrassing for you, Gary. Just admit that there aren't any scholars. You, he, he said they began preaching immediately that they saw the risen Jesus. That's in okay. his books on the crucifixion. He, was, he calls himself an atheist. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Ludeman estimates that resurrection preaching began as soon as a week after Jesus died. That is obviously not the same as affirming group appearances. What There's about Crossan? What did Crossan think? Crossan is interesting. I know he, th all, he, he thought altered states of consciousness or, in essence, hallucinations, but did he grant he, group appearances? He, Crossan interpreted group appearance accounts in the gospel as later legendary developments and that the original resurrection experiences were individual visions or apparitions similar to Paul's experience. He's really interesting. He says... The disciples had experiences not unlike appearances of the dead when they have what's called um, post-death visions or mm -hmm. post-death communications. Okay. He says, we are, we are mm -hmm. creatures who are hardwired to see visions. And then he says, but I don't accept the naturalistic theory. He says that more than once. Yeah, he so says I don't that, think, but... but he, I, think it's, I think his view's natural, but he says he doesn't accept naturalistic theory. So I think he thinks, here's my guess. Yeah, but cross... Go ahead. I think he thinks that the disciples saw appearances, um, but it's like what people see when they see a dead loved one the same day. Exactly. Those are called post-bereavement hallucination experiences. I suspect this is a likely candidate for what the disciple Peter experienced. I, I know a case where a person was buried that day, and people said they saw him that night, said they saw this woman that night. So Gary has some secondhand knowledge of PBHEs, and is admitting here that PBHEs can happen quickly enough to account for early belief in Jesus? That's amazing. Thank you, Gary. 
Well, he says I, I, altered states of consciousness, and the way he describes it in the book, there's, hey, listen, it's hard to distinguish. We're, we're not Dom. We can only let him define his view, and we can repeat what he said. Yeah. I don't know how else it's like to do trying it. to I, nail jello to a wall. I, I can't say, you said this. You don't believe that. You mean this. That's interesting, because Bart and I accused you of misrepresenting Bart's views, even when he's telling you they're not his views. But in this very interview, you're going to double down on telling Bart that he's wrong about Bart. Is Dr. Habermas going to respond to Paul Aguia and Bart Ehrman's criticisms? They argue that he mis misrepresents the latter. I disagree. A guy, after I defended my view, a guy wrote to me and gave me 20, about between 10 and 20 page numbers where the quote that I made is over and over, I'm sticking by what I do. More on this in a future video. So um, I think, I mean, but there's so many options. You could take a, um, you could take an openness view. You could take a finite view of Jesus. You could be, he, I'm, he's not this at all, but you could be a Hindu. You could be, there are, there are gods that are not infinite and so on. Okay, so let's say this. This is volume one of Gary's uh, magnum opus. This is your life work on the resurrection in four volumes. Okay, so now they're just moving on to other questions. To review, Gary says his minimal facts cannot be explained without a resurrection. People have suggested hallucinations can explain the minimal facts. Gary says hallucinations don't explain group appearances. I point out that group appearances are not one of the minimal facts. Gary avoids this for 15 minutes. The end. Paul Aguia, thank you for steel manning me, Mike. I've got to go, but we'll send a few super chat questions that I will listen to answer later. Ignore it if too many. All right, thanks, Paul Aguia. I hope you're doing well. Thank you, Mike. I hope you're doing well, even though you gave me a failing grade. Zero. And I, I'm not Zero percent. Yeah. Out of curiosity, what other kinds of questions were being asked? Mike and I did a, a book. What do you think of Andrew Luck? We did the case for the resurrection with a, yeah. almost 100 pages on natural. In my head, Gary's deliberately avoiding that one too. Sorry, Andrew. If you've watched this long in the video, perhaps, like me, you're a New Testament enthusiast who doesn't have similarly interested peers outside of church groups or angry atheist Reddit. If that's you, Dr. Bart Ehrman has a message for you. Over the years, some people have lamented that they're no longer welcome in their church, or they've decided to stop attending, and as a result, they feel a kind of loss of community. Many people have asked us whether there's a place they could connect with other people who have the same interests in biblical studies and early Christianity to discuss these things. Plus, we've received several requests from people for more in-depth courses than we already provide when it comes to biblical scholarship. We've come up with a solution. It's called the Biblical Studies Academy, or BSA. It's an online learning platform that offers comprehensive biblical scholarship training inside of a members-only community. In the Biblical Studies Academy, you'll get access to interactive courses and a vibrant online community where you can discuss with others, ask questions, and get feedback from experts. Within the BSA, we'll be including a new kind of course that we've never done before. We're going to start providing semester-long university-level courses led by prominent professors of biblical studies teaching the sorts of things they teach in their day jobs with syllabi, readings, and quizzes. Everyone who is a member will receive three university-length courses every year along with all of our courses in How Scholars Read the Bible series that we've already recorded, plus two new ones every year, along with a monthly webinar with me called Bart's Spotlight Series. Everyone in the BSA will get all of that. In addition, they'll get 25% discounts on all of our products not in the BSA, plus, possibly most important, they'll be members of a community. You, if you join, will be in this community where you can join in with challenges, fun quizzes, group studies, live events, and discussions with others interested in these topics. The value of this package would be $2,700, but we're not going to charge that. If you're interested in joining the BSA, we have an early bird special, 14-day free trial, after which it will cost $34.95 a month. I've been in the BSA community myself for a few weeks now, and have been having a great time connecting with similarly interested people and starting Dr. Goodacre's new course. It's just begun, so if you sign up now, it'll be easy to catch up. Even better, there's a free trial so you can come in and feel the place out before committing. Just go to tinyurl.com slash Bart Academy. And by using that link, you'll also be helping the mission of this channel. And I really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. And until next time, later.